Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Let's start off by talking a little bit about hearing loss in general. Uh, it affects about one in a thousand people uh, that are born deaf worldwide, and about one in a thousand will develop deafness over their lifetime. There are about half a million Americans that are deaf and don't derive significant benefit from hearing aids. And uh, there are about half a million uh, Americans that could benefit from cochlear implantation. And the number of patients that have actually gotten cochlear implants is probably closer to 60 to 80,000 uh, worldwide now. So we're really just scratching the surface in terms of bringing this technology to, uh, uh, to the population that could benefit from it. In terms of the pediatric population, about 0.3% uh, of children under five years of age are deaf, and there are probably about 200,000 uh, potential candidates in this country. And we're beginning to diagnose children earlier with hearing loss with universal uh, screening uh, in all newborn, newborn nurseries. And so we're really identifying these patients earlier and can bring this technology to them when it'll have a maximum impact on their lives. So let's talk a little bit about the normal ear and ear anatomy. The ear can really be divided into uh, four parts. There's the external ear, the middle ear, inner ear, and we can't neglect the brain as part of the central part of, of hearing. The external ear, which is the part that we can see in the ear canal, actually takes the sound vibrations from the environment and channels it into the uh, middle ear. And so it's a, it's a way of taking the sound and conducting it to the middle ear. The middle ear is also a mechanical structure that's comprised of an air-filled space and has three bones of hearing that move as a lever and conduct the sound vibrations from the air of the external ear to the fluid in the inner ear. And really for the point of uh, view of our talk here tonight, what we're really going to focus on is the inner ear. The inner ear is made up of the cochlea, which is the snail shell shaped organ of hearing which takes sound vibrations and transmits those, converts those into an electrical impulse that's then conducted down the nerves of hearing to the brain. And finally, the brain is the, the ultimate uh, organ of hearing in that if the sound doesn't get there and doesn't get processed by the brain, we don't hear it and we can't make sense of it. So that's a vital part of our understanding and hearing. Hearing loss can occur from a deficit of any one of those four. And in general, we break down hearing loss into two broad categories. There's conductive hearing loss, which is a mechanical deficit, the problem getting the sound vibrations from the environment to the inner ear. And then there is sensor and neural hearing loss, which is a problem converting that vibration to an electrical signal that the nerves in the brain can understand. And it's really that sensor and neural part that we're going to focus on today. So let's talk a little bit about cochlear anatomy. The cochlea is the part of the inner ear that has that spiral shape. If you were to cut across one of those turns of the cochlea, it's filled with several different chambers with fluid in it. Sound vibrations go to those, uh, those fluid-filled chambers, and they vibrate the membranes that divide those. Inside the cochlea are a number of these microscopic hair cells. When these hairs on the hair cells bend, it causes the hair cells to either fire more or less quickly. And that's really the part of the inner ear that actually converts the mechanical vibration to an electrical signal. 
An interesting fact about the cochlea that we take advantage of in cochlear implantation is the fact that it's tonotopically organized. So what does that mean? Well, you can think about it that if you were to unroll the cochlea, part of the, that tube that you would be left with is tuned to the high frequencies, part is tuned to the mid frequencies, and part is tuned to the low frequencies. So there's a, actually a spatial separation of the frequencies at different parts of the cochlea. The cochlea then sends that information to the auditory nerve, and we know that there are about 30,000 individual nerve fibers in the auditory nerve, in a, in a healthy, normal auditory nerve. We know that most people who have problems with hearing loss, with sensorineural hearing loss, actually have a problem in the cochlea and not so much in the nerve itself. So if these little hairs that bend and send an electrical signal to the nerve are lost, we're still not sure exactly what's going on with the nerve that used to listen to those signals. So the nerves themselves may still be there, but there's just nothing to stimulate them. And that's why people have the hearing loss. So if we look at this uh, schematically, we can think about the inner ear taking the sound vibration, converting it to the hair cell signals, which then goes down the nerve to the brain. A severely damaged inner ear can still receive the, the mechanical vibration, but it just can't uh, turn it into that electrical signal that the nerve would understand. And that's really what a cochlear implant is designed to do. It's designed to take those, um, the sound signals turn them into electrical signals that go directly to the hearing nerve. So it bypasses the injured part of the inner ear. So if we look at the components of a cochlear implant, there are two basic categories. There's the outside part and the inside part. The outside components, the part that you wear on the outside, almost like a hearing aid, is made up of a microphone, and a processor that takes that electrical information from the microphone and digitizes it in a way that the implant can uh, then use. There's also a headpiece that's worn on the outside of the skin, above and behind the ear, that takes that information from the processor and sends it to the internal part of the implant. So if we look at the internal parts, This is the part that's placed surgically. There's a receiver which is placed under the skin, behind and above the ear, that takes those radio waves from the headpiece and converts it to electrical signals that are then sent through a wire to an electrode that's implanted inside the cochlea right up against the uh, inner ear hearing nerve. So something that, somebody, that people always ask is, well, how does it sound? And I think it's worthwhile trying to give you an example of that. I don't think we can tell you as well as somebody who's actually been through it. Um, but it's worthwhile thinking about how does hearing loss sound? And I think we need to start there. And you need to remember that hearing loss is not just a matter of the sound being too soft. It's a matter of it losing the clarity and the inability to understand what the words are, not just a matter of hearing that there are words out there. So for example, if we try to simulate profound hearing loss, it may just sound like a buzz. More moderate hearing loss. We may hear individual words and certain components of the words, but the consonants and a lot of the meaning of the sounds are lost. And I'll play the normal. So once you hear what the normal words are, if you go back to the more severe, you may be able to pick it out a little bit better. But you can understand how people living with this type of deficit have a terrible hard time understanding what's being said. So what cochlear implant users actually hear is difficult to simulate. And it's difficult to, to tell people who don't have one. Um, what we can say is that we can take the sounds and process it digitally and try to simulate what a cochlear implant can produce. 
So for example, an eight-channel processor, which is equivalent to most uh, uh, what, what people can hear from a uh, cochlear implant now, may well sound like this. So it's certainly not perfect, but if you start off with a severe or profound hearing loss, that's giving you information that there was no way that you could get before, even with well-fit hearing aids. And how does music sound? That's another question that people will ask. If we hear what early cochlear implant uh, users could hear with music, So you can hear from what early cochlear implants could provide. It can provide some of the rate of the music, but not a lot of the quality of the, of the music. And thankfully, as technology has advanced, more advanced signal processing technologies can provide more uh, uh, quality of music and not just the underlying uh, uh, rhythm. So what affects performance? When we implant patients, we would like to be able to tell them what it is that would influence how well they will do. Certainly some people do very well and some people don't do as well. And we try to pick out what are the individual uh, uh, factors that could influence performance. Well certainly the technology that we use can influence performance and thankfully that has been increasing in helping us with the, uh, with the results. The cause of the hearing loss can also influence how well people do. And the number of nerve fibers that survive has a big effect on how well cochlear implants work as well. And then the central processing, the ability for the brain to make sense of the signals that are being presented is crucial to this. And we think that as, as we're looking into this more and more, we find that that has more and more of, a, of, a, of an effect on how well people are doing with cochlear implantation. We'd like to be able to look into our crystal ball and tell our, our prospective patients exactly how well they're going to do, but we're still not able to do that. And I think uh, Jan Larkey will be talking a little bit more about some of the factors that can make somebody do well with a cochlear implant as opposed to poorly. Almost all causes of sensor neural hearing loss are amenable to cochlear implantation if they're severe enough. That is, assuming that they preserve the, the anatomy of the inner ear to allow us to put the implant in, right, and also allow the nerve to continue to survive. There's clearly a window of opportunity that we have, especially for children, in terms of when to implant. As children's brains are developing, they need to develop getting sound information in to make the use of, uh, of auditory information. And so when children are diagnosed with hearing loss, it becomes critical to offer or consider them for cochlear implantation at an earlier time so that that brain is not used for other sensory modalities and not used for uh, auditory processing. So how young can we implant patients? Well, the FDA uh, guidelines say 12 months, all right, but children can be implanted even earlier than that. And it seems that the younger that we implant patients, the better that they do. So we're still exploring how young to implant patients once they're identified as, as being potential uh, candidates for implantation. I couldn't resist putting a picture of my son in, getting his newborn infant screening uh, a couple of weeks ago. Children are being screened now in the um, uh, newborn ICUs, so we're pick, uh, our new, uh, newborn uh, nurseries, so we are picking up hearing loss at an early stage now, and that allows us to intervene much uh, sooner. Older patients can also benefit. There's no upper age limit for cochlear implantation. There's always a question about which ear to implant. 
Pe people who are uh, candidates for cochlear implantation have bilateral or both sides affected. So how do we decide which ear to implant? Many times it comes down to just the patient's preference or what side is their dominant hand and what would be more comfortable for them to use an, uh, the external uh, components. But we also get radiology images. We get CT scans or MRIs to try to pick which ear. We do a lot of extensive uh, audiometric testing to determine which ear could potentially have the greatest nerve surviving. Some of the imaging studies that we use are CT scans and MRI. You can see on this MRI image, this is the um, snail shell shaped cochlea here. Gives us an idea if that's normal, if it's open, if, that's able, if we're able to put a, a cochlear implant into that inner ear. And this is the cochlea on a CT scan. That's important because some diseases will obliterate the inner ear anatomy. And if you look at this, this is a CT scan of a patient who had had meningitis. On one side, we see just bone where it used to have a cochlea. And that's because new bone has formed and obliterated the area that used to be the, that corkscrew of a cochlea that we can see normally on the other side. And this can make it very difficult for us to use a cochlear implant in these types of situations. So obviously, we would prefer to implant the left ear in a patient such as this. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the surgery. It requires general anesthesia, takes about two and a half to three hours, and patients normally go home on the same day. The incision is behind the ear and a little bit up under the side of the head. The device is planned to be behind the ear in a place where it won't bother with wearing glasses. Through the incision, we make a little well. We mark a spot where we're going to put the internal components, and we make a little uh, trough in the bone where that sits and secure that to the bone. And then we drill a hole from behind the inner ear, uh, behind the middle ear, into the inner ear where we open up a part of the cochlea and thread the device in. So the device is threaded in such a way that it will curl around the cochlea so that when the electrodes that are stimulated at one side will stimulate the, uh, the low frequency uh, nerves and the electrodes at the other side will stimulate the high frequency hearing nerves. We can test the device intraoperatively. We can send electrical signals in and then see what the nerve, how the nerves respond to those signals. So we have a pretty good idea about how well the cochlear uh, implant is going to work afterwards. And we get a post-operative x-ray that shows us where the, where the electrode is inside of the inner ear. As you can see here, this little curl of the electrode inside the inner ear. People can go back to work or back to school, usually within the week. It takes about three weeks for things to heal, and then we activate the device and let them start using it. There are no restrictions on activities afterwards, but patients uh, should refrain from getting MRI scans because of the magnet inside of the Im implant. And I'll just say a, a word about our history with cochlear implants here at Stanford. Stanford was actually one of the places where cochlear implant uh, research was pioneered in 1964, 20 years before the actual uh, FDA approval of the cochlear implant. Pioneering work was done by uh, Dr. Blair Simmons and uh, uh, Dr. Bob White. Um, the first uh, six patients were uh, implanted here that actually could hear pitch changes and know that speech uh, was speech. And we continue to uh, work on some innovative uh, uh, inner ear research. We're working on ways of looking into the inner ear with microendoscopes and trying to look at the actual anatomy of the inner ear to better diagnose why people have the hearing loss and potentially better uh, uh, design implants to take advantage of the uh, anatomy that an individual will have left in the inner ear. We are also fortunate to have uh, recruited uh, Stefan Heller, uh, who's a uh, world-renowned uh, stem cell researcher who uh, is focusing on rebuilding the inner ear and regenerative medicine for the inner ear, finding ways of taking the cells that are normally present, even in an injured ear, and regrowing hair cells from those. So maybe someday we won't need cochlear implants to make people hear again. 
And with this, I'd like to pass it over to Jan Larkey. It's my pleasure to be here this evening and talk to you about my wonderful job, which is working with the candidates to evaluate patients for cochlear implantation. I feel really fortunate that I get this opportunity because cochlear implantation is a life-transforming experience, and it's really wonderful to be able to take part in this. As Dr. Blevins mentioned before, the cochlear implant team is a multidisciplinary team. There are lots of us who work together to evaluate the patients and prepare them for cochlear implantation. So of course, the most important members are the patient and the family, the otolaryngologist who does the medical assessment and the surgery, the audiologist who will do the hearing testing, and the educators and speech language pathologists are especially important when we work with the pediatric population because these children need lots of rehabilitation that's ongoing in order to help them learn to maximize the benefit from their cochlear implantation and learn to interpret these sounds that they hear, which for many of these young children are the first sounds that they've ever heard. A psychotherapist is also very important, or a psychologist, because of the uh, transformative effects of implantation. Patients need to learn, when they have hearing loss, how to adapt to living in a world of silence. It affects all of their communication. And then getting some hearing back also can have tremendous effects. And so patients often need to be able to talk to a therapist or a mental health professional to learn how to deal with change and with, with um, the effects of, of hearing loss in general. And the hearing aid specialist is also very important in the assessment process uh, because we want to make sure that patients are appropriately fit with hearing aids while we go through the evaluation. If somebody can benefit from hearing aids, we want to know that in advance. So candidates are those, as Dr. Blevins already mentioned, who have significant hearing loss and receive limited benefit from, from their hearing aids. Patients have to be medically stable to undergo anesthesia. Any age can be considered. Um, and patients really need to be motivated and informed because this is a device that stays with them for their entire lifetime. And so we want to make sure that patients understand what this entails um, and what their ongoing life will be like with a device in place. And also it's really important to make sure that people have access to rehabilitation in order to learn how to interpret the sounds that they hear through their implant. So I want to orient you a little bit to the audiogram, which is the graph that we use to chart hearing. When patients come in, we evaluate their hearing to make sure that they do indeed have significant hearing loss. So at the top of the audiogram, you see the numbers going from low frequency up to high frequency. And across this axis, we see numbers that indicate how loud a sound has to be in order for the patient to just barely detect it. So the range of normal hearing is in the hatched area at the top, and that is um, represented by a pin dropping. After that, we see the range where normal conversation falls and the uh, a general dis uh, listing of the sounds that patients hear. You can see that the high frequency sounds also have less energy, but they're also responsible for about 90% of speech clarity. So if all you hear are the vowel sounds, which are generally in the low frequency region and have more energy, you're going to miss the clarity. You're going to hear a lot of uh, uh sounds, but not a lot of the, the necessary frequency information to understand words. And farther down on the graph, you see symbols that represent other sounds that are much, much louder. So those sounds um, have more energy. Now, What's popping up now is the range of hearing loss where somebody with, might benefit from a hearing aid. And you can see that it's a pretty large range. Um, and so those patients come in and they're candidates for amplification. And what we also know, though, is that the range for cochlear implantation from the 1990s showed that patients had to have essentially no hearing. Um, that if there was any benefit from hearing aids at all, then they would probably not be considered for cochlear implantation. But that has certainly changed today. In 2005, you can see that we're sort of 
encroaching on the range of hearing aids almost. So patients with more and more and more hearing are now eligible for cochlear implantation and tend to do quite well with this device. This slide just shows you a little bit about the expanding cochlear implant criteria over the course of time. And so you can see that back in 1985, only adults were considered candidates for cochlear implantation. Children were not even considered candidates at that time. And if you look at the speech perception score, patients, adults, were only eligible for implantation if they did not understand anything on the preoperative testing that we did. Fast forward up to the year 2000, and you can see that now we're implanting adults and children, children as young as 12 months of age, and a, who have some speech understanding, and we're also implanting adults who now can understand up to 50% of sentence material in a tape-recorded message. And so we're starting to implant patients with more hearing because we know that they will do better with a cochlear implant than they do with hearing aids. So what are the factors that influence the outcome with a cochlear implant? We know that patients who are implanted younger do better with a cochlear implant, and that's likely because the brain is, a, is very plastic and the neural connections from the ear to the brain are still forming. And so if we can provide some sound input, then these patients will develop the ability to recognize and interpret these sounds. So we also know that the shortest amount of time a patient has experienced hearing loss or deafness the better they will do with their cochlear implant. So somebody who has had significant profound hearing loss for three years will do better perhaps than somebody who has had hearing loss for 65 years. Additionally, we know that um, patients who have had significant hearing loss for long periods of time can still receive benefit. An interesting population are the teens and those people who are adults and have never heard and then decide to get cochlear implantation. So the potential for these users is still tremendous. They can still have lots of sound awareness, um, but they must be very, very motivated because it's likely that they will not be able to understand speech over the telephone or recognize normal conversational speech without the addition of lip reading. These patients, we spend a lot of time with them talking about realistic expectations so that they will be prepared for what the likely outcome will be. This is also true for teenagers because teenagers enter those, those challenging years when um, they sometimes want to reject um, wearing hearing aids. And um, so a teenager who wants to pursue cochlear implantation, needs. we spend a lot of time with them and we also have the psychotherapist spend a lot of time talking about what it means to wear an external device and what it means to look a little bit different than perhaps your peers do. Um, so we also know that some of these patients do obtain open set understanding and are able to understand speech, but generally it's more limited, so that's why we spend more time talking with them. There are three devices that are FDA approved for use in the United States. And they're just listed here in alphabetical order. Advanced Bionics is one company. Cochlear Corporation uh, with headquarters in Australia is a second company. And Medell is a third company with their manufacturing and headquarters in Austria. The Advanced Bionics device consists of the two processor options. One is a body-worn device and one is an ear-level device. Uh, they both have their advantages and their limitations, and we talk to the patients about what their interests are, what their lifestyle is like to help them decide which device to get and which manufacturer to get and then which device they would feel more comfortable using. And this is a picture of what the internal device is like that uh, is placed during the operation. This is what the Cochlear Corporation device looks like. This is their internal device. And this is a nice picture of the spiral electrode array. They have their ear level processor and their body worn processor. This is a brand new product which has just come out in May. So all of the device manufacturers are constantly working on improving their products and coming out with new technology. 
This device has the added feature of being splash proof so that patients can go out in the rain and not worry about having their electronics damaged. Or and then the third product is Medel Corporation, and this is what their internal device looks like and their external ear level device. They actually don't have a, they do have a body processor, but most people prefer to use the ear level processor. The cochlear implant benefits in children are tremendous. Uh, it allows children to hear their voice and hear their parents' voice, which can be a tremendous advantage when your three-year-old is running down the aisle at Costco and you want to call them. And prior to implantation, the children couldn't hear their name. And with an implant, children can hear their name. And so it's great reassurance to parents to know that they can call their child's name for safety reasons. Um, these children learn also to alert and recognize environmental sounds, which allows them to know alert to sounds of danger as well as sounds of pleasure. And the expressive and receptive language skills also increase and, and grow and develop in these children. We also know that children who have primarily used total communication or sign language prior to implantation often switch their modality of communication, dropping their signs and transitioning over to using oral speech and communication as their primary mode. The benefits of implantation in adults are also tremendous and we have a cochlear implant recipient here who will speak with you in a little bit and she can give you more firsthand information about her personal experience but also of great importance is just general sound awareness. Uh, that lends to a sense of safety, a sense of connectedness with the environment. Um, these adults are often able to understand speech without the use of lip reading, which as you can imagine can be a tremendous advantage while driving in the car, uh, during power outages, when camping, et cetera, whenever there's not a lot of light to use lip reading cues. Also, telephone use opens up a whole new range of access to the world, builds self-confidence, um, and removes some barriers to communication and interpersonal interaction, which are one of the biggest difficulties with hearing loss. So that leads in also to the psychosocial benefits that patients report to me that they feel more confident just in their everyday life, that they're not as worried about somebody asking them a question or going to the grocery store and not being able to understand what somebody's asking them. So for, if you'd like some more information, here's our contact information and we'd be happy to answer any questions after our presentation as well as in the future. It's my privilege now to introduce to you our cochlear implant user, Cindy Smith. And here's a little bit of information about Cindy. She uh, had hearing loss that developed about 20 years ago from unknown causes, and it got slowly worse over time. Her right ear was her better ear, and uh, you can see that here by her sentence comprehension score. So prior to implantation, she achieved 32% of words in, in sentences that she was able to recognize and 0% in her left ear. And you can see here that she had what we would describe as a severe to profound hearing loss. In February, Cindy received a cochlear implant to her left ear, and these are her cochlear implant thresholds that were just obtained the other day. So you can see that she now is able to hear and, I, and hear sounds in almost the normal range. That doesn't mean she has normal hearing, but it does mean that she's able to, to, to detect very, very soft sounds. Um, her speech understanding has gone from 0% in the left ear to 99% understanding of sentences in a quiet situation and 96% sentence understanding with a fair amount of background noise. So this is a really, really remarkable performance. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Cindy to come up and share a little bit with you about her personal experience. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you to Dr. Blevins and Jan for inviting me here. I hope I'm talking loud enough. Okay. Um, about a week ago, I got a message on my answering machine from Jan asking me to come over tonight and share with you my experiences. And I was very happy to be able to do that. But more importantly, I was ecstatic because I could actually hear the message on the answering machine. 
And five months ago, there was no way that I would ever understand what, what was being said. And I'd have to wait for my husband to get home and listen to the, to the answer machine and tell me what the message was. So I was very excited about that. Um, as Jan mentioned, I started losing my hearing when I was about 19 years old. Um, it progressively got worse. I'd say over the last couple of years, I got to the point where I would say it was very severe. Um, and in particular, uh, about a year ago, I started to realize and admit that the quality of my life was being affected. Um, in what ways was that happening? Um, I could no longer use the telephone, uh, or, or it was very difficult which means I couldn't make doctor's appointments, dentist appointments. Um, I have two small children. My oldest started kindergarten in the fall. And with kindergartners, you plan play dates. Well, if I can't use the phone, I just can't call up another mom and say, hey, would you like to have a play date today? Because I wouldn't be able to hear them very well. So I started having to rely on email, which is a wonderful thing. But unfortunately, when you have uh, moms with small children, you're not on the computer all the time. So I had to rely on that. I couldn't understand messages on the answering machine. So I became more dependent on my husband um, to uh, translate the messages for me. Um, I, as I said, I have two small children. So in the back, you can imagine how much they argue back and forth. And over the last year or so, I was unable to understand what they were saying. So I'm sure that they were saying quite a bit that I wouldn't have liked. Um, going to the movies over the last year, well, actually, probably the last couple of years, I've started, I started to have to use the FM headphones, which is a wonderful thing. Um, but even so, even with that, that became very difficult. The last movie I saw before my implant surgery was Million Dollar Baby. In fact, I think we saw that maybe two to three weeks before my surgery. That was a very difficult movie, if anyone has, saw it, has seen it, because there was a lot of shadows, and the actors had their back to the camera quite a bit, which is not quite common in the movies. So I couldn't lip read. So I understood the gist of what was happening in that movie, but I missed probably 90% of the dialogue. And how does that make you feel when you're, when you're sitting there and you know you're supposed to be hearing something and you can't hear it? So movies became very stressful for me. Um, also, as my hearing has progressed, I think it's become isolating in a lot of ways. Going out in a large noisy environments is, was very difficult. Going out to a restaurant was very difficult because I had to rely on lip reading so much. So while everybody else can sit back and relax and enjoy their meal, I had to be intently focused on what people were saying and make sure that I looked at each person. And when you're so focused on listening, it makes it very hard to actually speak up and actually respond. And what I found is, is more and more I became more introvertish because the conversations were moving so quickly that um, I couldn't keep up with it. So I would say um, in the fall, I, quite, I finally got to the point where I realized that, um, that the cochlear implant was something that I should consider. Um, it, to be honest, I was very afraid of the surgery at first. Um, the, as you saw the description of how the surgery happens, um, it's not, it doesn't seem very pleasant. So that was um, fear, that, that made me very fearful. But I think the most, the, my biggest fear was that the implant itself would not work. All, the, all these years, as I've been losing my hearing, I've always been taught or told that don't worry, when you, get, when you get to this point where you can't function, we'll have that implant for you. 
Well, I always thought that that time was going to be years and years down, and here I was in my mid-30s, and that time was now. And so my fear was that I was going to do this, and it wouldn't work. And so what would that mean? That'd mean I'd have absolutely nothing to hope for. And so that was the biggest thing that I had to get over. And I researched as much as I could. I, I had a wonderful audiologist, wonderful surgeon that provided the information for me. And I decided that the potential benefits far outweighed the risk. And so in February, I had my surgery. The surgery went very well. Um, I experienced the normal things that uh, come with the surgery. Um, I had some balance issues probably for a week. I was driving back at, uh, in seven days. I did lose my sense of taste. Um, I think it came back fully at the two-month mark. And so I was very happy because I can taste ice cream again. Um, other than that, I would say there was pretty much no, no other complications. On March 9th, I came in for my activation. My husband was my support system. And, um, sorry. Um, he held my hand while they hooked me up. Oh, sorry. And then Jan turned it on. And I immediately heard noise. I heard sounds. Sounded like um, one of those old radios that you'd fine tune and it's kind of making all sorts of sounds and then all of a sudden you hit the right channel and all of a sudden, boom, you can hear it. And Jan and my husband were sitting there and they were chatting about something. And I knew what they were saying, but I thought it was because I was lip reading because I've turned into a very good lip reader. And I quickly realized that, no, I don't think that's why. And I turned my head and I realized, oh my God, I actually hear what she's saying. Now it was absolutely the worst sound it didn't sound like anything like normal speech, but I heard her words, and I knew at that moment I was going to be okay. And um, it w how did it sound? It sounded um, very high-pitched, very robotic. It sounded like a robot who sucked in helium from a balloon. Um, it sounded, the best way I can describe it, it was like being in a tunnel and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and you just want to reach up and, and get to the light, but you can't quite do it. It was just kind of far away. And um, my own voice was very loud and strange sounding. I had a, a bit of an echo, so it was very uncomfortable for me to speak at first. Um, I remember Jan covered her lips, and she did some testing, and she asked me the, to... Uh, she said some colors, and, and I was supposed to repeat back the colors, and I think I got everything except silver. And then she repeated, or she said, the days of the week and the months of the year, and I was able to get it very well. Um, and that's kind of where we stopped at the first day. And I went home, I was driving home, and I knew that music that I was familiar with was going to be what came back first. So I popped in a CD, and it was a children's CD, and I heard all of a sudden Big Bird singing Farmer in the Dell. And it sounded, it sounded very, like a very high-pitched robotic Big Bird, but I, I heard the, the whole song. And um, then I came back my next day, the next day for an additional mapping, and that helped tremendously. We kept fine-tuning it. Um, and every day, I can honestly say, it got better and better. And now, at, um, well, I'll go back. Um, the high pitches came back first, so I didn't have a lot of environmental sounds at first. It was very quiet, but I could hear speech. Um, and then little by little, all those other things started to come back. I heard the, my dog's nails on the wood floors, and then I heard myself typing on the keyboard. Um, I didn't realize how loud the toilet was when you flushed it. <laughs> 
I remember very early that my husband and I happened to be brushing our teeth at the same time, and I turned to him and I said, wow, God, that's really loud. Do you hear that all the time? Um, what else? Um, my children have helped me tremendously because they're very noisy, and they keep me busy, and they have actually been the hardest because they have the high pitch stands. Um, but that has come back. I can hear my six-year-old very well. My three-year-old presents more of a challenge because he's still developing his speech. Um, let's see, what else? I can hear birds chirp again. I can hear, um, I can hear the kids talk better when I'm driving in the car. Before, I used to have to pull over to the side of the road, turn around so I could see them and find out what they were fighting about. Now I know what they're saying, so it's kind of, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, what else? About at the, maybe the one month, one month and a half mark, I was at the park with some moms and their children, and we were having an Easter egg hunt. And I had my digital camera, and I was taking tons of pictures. And I kept hearing this beep, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. I was looking everywhere, and finally I turned to this mom next to me, and I said, what is this beep? Do you hear it? And she looked at me like, it's your camera. And I said, you mean it's making a noise? And she said, yeah, it always makes a noise when you take a picture. And I had no idea because my hearing has been so bad ever since they've had digital, digital cameras. So I had no idea what this beep was. And then also for Easter, we went down to visit my in-laws and we were outside in the evening and I heard this constant kind of a, a low hum and I realized, oh, those are the crickets. And it was such a beautiful sound to hear that again. Um, I can tell you, let's see, the telephone. I am using this telephone. I can hear on my cell phone very well, which is an is a amazing thing. Um, I can hear in a regular telephone. Um, I have found that it is easier to wear uh, my Bose headphones plugged into an amplified telephone because the sand is right next to the, to the microphone. But that's just my own personal preference. Um, I did go to a movie again. Uh, my first movie was a children's movie called Robots, which was probably a hard one to start with because robots have no lips. And um, I actually tried to, to listen without, this was about at the month mark. I listened without the FM headphones and I wasn't able to do it. It got very frustrating, so I put the headphones back on and boom, it was just clear as a whistle. And I can't tell you what a tremendous difference that is, because you can actually sit back and relax and enjoy the movie instead of sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, my hearing's getting worse, I can't hear the dialogue, you know, all the things that go through your mind. Um, and now at the three-month mark, I did see my first adult movie, which was Cinderella Man, um, and I was able to go through the entire movie without the headphones, and I actually heard the music, I heard the dialogue, and it was just wonderful. And uh, that music is another thing. Everyone told me that music that you're familiar with is what's going to come back first. So I started losing my hearing in the 80s, so the music I was listening to was rock from the 80s, so um, that's what I started with, and it came right back. Everything very rhythmic, bass kind of music, very deep sound of music came back first. Instrumental music is still hard. It still requires some effort, but I think over time I'm hoping it gets better. Um, and now I, my husband uh, celebrated by buying me an iPod. And so now I listen to my music everywhere that I go, and I listen to books on tape and, and everything, and it's very wonderful. And um, I'm very lucky, I'm very thankful for um, to Dr. Blevins for his help, and Jan for being so patient um, when I come in for my mapping and I try to describe what I'm hearing. It's not an easy thing to describe to a, a, hear, a normal hearing person, and she's been very patient. And I truly, truly feel that I've gotten a portion of my life back, and it was next to marrying my husband was the best decision ever. So 
Anyways, thank you for listening to me. The, the question is, how, what, how is the sound encoded to be presented to the nerve so it makes sense? And it's a very good question, and it's a combination of things. It's both which electrode in the cochlea is, is stimulated will hit different populations of nerves, and it's also the rate at which those electrodes fire. And it's really a combination of that that gives the brain the information that sounds like a normal sound. The question is really, how do we determine candidacy and are cochlear implants applicable to people with even moderate hearing losses? Um, Jan, would you like to? At this time, we do need patients to have a severe to a profound hearing loss. So moderate hearing loss that can still be helped by conventional hearing aids should be helped by hearing aids and not by cochlear implantation. And let me just add also that the surgery has the side effect of destroying the hearing that's in the ear, so we want to make sure that if you can benefit from amplification that you go that route. The question is, is the cost covered by Medicare, all or partial? Yes, cochlear implantation is covered by Medicare as well as most of the other insurance companies. The question is really how do we decide which ear to implant when there are different factors affecting each of the ears. One ear has been never really worked and one ear was working well and then stopped working at a later date. And that depends really on what is left in each of those ears. We would prefer to implant the ear that was most recently lost, that most recently lost hearing. In some cases it's better to implant the better hearing ear in that we think that there's better nerve survival in those ears. But we also, as Jan was saying, we do know that we lose the hearing in the great majority of, of patients when we implant an ear. So we don't want to take away useful function to try to gain more. But that's something that really has to be worked out on an individual basis, assuming that, um, that there's no, nothing else that would help us uh, make that de determination. The question is, at what degree should we consider an evaluation for a cochlear implant? I think an easy way to think about it is if you're able to use the telephone or not. So if you're able to use a telephone pretty effectively, then you would not be considered a cochlear implant candidate. If you find that you're struggling a lot on the phone, that you need an amplified phone, uh, that you're having difficulty understanding conversation one-on-one, -on -one, even in a quiet room, then you might look into cochlear implants at that point in time. So the question is, with conventional hearing aids working in background noise and how well does that work? You know, there's a lot of really new hearing aid technology that can do somewhat of a pretty good job eliminating background noise, focusing on the speech itself. I mean, nothing's perfect. It's not the normal hearing ear. But the new hearing aid technology is actually pretty remarkable. Um, so it certainly is worth trying. May I ask Cindy to, to comment on that background noise with the cochlear implant compared to background noise with the hearing aids as you, as you remember them? Um, I guess I'd like to say that speech and noise is the most difficult thing. And, um, but with the implant, or the reason why I like the implant is it has the ability to give you soft, medium and high noises. And what I found with the conventional hearing aids, it's everything was just loud. So to me, what I experienced in noisy situations was, was that just everything was loud and it was just too much information. With the, with the implant, um, I'm much more effective. We have a noise program so that we can bring those background noises down. Um, and I'm much more able to carry on conversations. It's still difficult. I can give you an example. I was in a, in a restaurant with 12 other moms and we were sitting around and there was no way that I would be able to hear what the, the conversation, well, I take that back. There was no way I could understand the conversation going on at the, the very end of the table. So, um, but I did know something was happening. And um, in terms of the people around me, so maybe six people, I was able to carry on conversations. And with my hearing aids, it was very hard to do, and I pretty much was just lip reading. So I could carry on a conversation with the person right here, 
Um, but it was more because I was reading lips that the, than the hearing aids were actually giving me. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's how, how well do people localize sound with this? And remember, the great majority of people who are getting cochlear implants are still being implanted in just one ear. And so um, sound localization still usually remains quite a challenge for them. There is some evidence that bilateral implantation, implanting patients in two ears, can restore some of that. But the data is still coming in, and, and the real world effect of that has yet to be really uh, determined. The question is really, is the sound processing information in a digital hearing aid similar to what we're doing in cochlear implants? And in a general sense, they are taking sound information, breaking it down into its elements, and presenting it in a way that sounds best to that individual. Um, but beyond the superficial um, processing, uh, um, there are some very uh, significant differences in that the way that the sound is transmitted to the inner ear is very different in a conventional hearing aid because it's all through the vibrations uh, with a speaker as opposed to stimulating discrete electrodes inside of the inner ear. So it's a, it's a good question. It's a complicated topic about just how sound is presented to the electrodes and it is something that's rapidly evolving as well. The question is, does, does balance depend on the same hairs? And the same type of hair cells that sense vibration from sound also sense motion. Uh, and so, yes, in, in, in many ways, uh, the inner ear hair cells are very similar, those that uh, receive balance information and those that receive, receive hearing information. They're in a different part of the cochlea, I mean, the different part of the inner ear, the balance system versus the cochlea. The question is, would it help if the nerve is damaged? And if there's no nerve to stimulate, it wouldn't help. If you have a, a nerve that can carry some information, it likely will. And that probably has a lot to do with why some people do great and some people do poorly. You know, some things that cause inner ear hearing loss, cochlear hearing loss, also can injure the, the inner ear nerve. And certainly you start off with 30,000 nerve fibers in that nerve, the fewer you have, Presumably, the, the harder it is to stimulate those and get meaningful information to the, inner, to the brain. Um, but we don't know exactly because it's not something that we can really look at to say, well, just how many nerve fibers are left in a given individual. But we know there is a range between having no nerve and having a perfectly normal nerve. The question is, is there cross-stimulation with the labyrinthine branches of the, of the eighth nerve, basically, whether stimulating the cochlea can cause some dizziness. And uh, it is possible. It doesn't usually happen. Some of the dizziness, like was described by uh, Ms. Smith, is probably just the act of putting the electrode into the inner ear uh, can change the balance sensation from that side and can make people dizzy for a week or so. Uh, some patients will get dizzy with stimulation of certain electrodes. It's not common, uh, but it can happen. Some people can have facial twitching with stimulation of uh, certain electrodes. But thankfully, the devices are flexible enough and can be programmed around those types of uh, adverse effects from stimulation so that they usually can still be um, used very effectively despite that. So it's not usually seen. It's not usually a problem. Uh, the question is what actually damages the hairs in the, in the cochlea? We don't know exactly for every case what causes it. I mean, uh, for example, for Ms. Smith, we never really were able to figure out why it is that the inner ear stopped working. In many cases, it can be because of um, loud noise exposure, that the little hairs are just sheared off from real mechanical trauma from loud noises. It can be that certain drugs have been used that have gotten into the inner ear and caused an injury either to those hairs or to other parts of the inner ear that are sensitive. It can be that a virus can get into the inner ear and cause inflammation. Or meningitis can cause inflammation by bacteria getting into the inner ear. So there's a whole host of potential uh, injuries that can occur to those little hairs. They're very fragile.